the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to imagine for a moment, you just picked up something brand new. And for the sake of illustration, maybe it was a brand new computer. You've been waiting forever to get this because it was specially built. It was designed for you and you alone. It was, the special, it was so special that the keys, the screen, all the specs about it were made with only you in mind. Something so special, you're excited to bring it home. And you open it up, pull it out, and find out it's broken. Now what do you do? For when something is broken, we're faced with only two options. Find someone to fix it, or leave it broken. Yes, some things we do simply leave broken and replace with something new, because it's not worth the money or hassle to fix it. But other things, we don't really have that option. So we have to find someone who is capable of fixing it. Now, depending on that item, that may be really simple or really challenging. Or so we often find the more specialized an item is, the harder it is to find someone capable of fixing it. When there are a few people, or even just one, who is capable of fixing an item, we realize our choices become simpler. Maybe not easier, but simpler by far. We are no longer stuck contemplating which repairman you're going to take it to, for that decision has already been made for you. You really don't have a say in the price either. For if only one person is capable of fixing it, you have two options. Fix it or leave it broken. In many ways, this is the thought process that happens in our gospel reading today. For so, what was supposed to be our Old Testament reading Joshua, who speaks to the people of Israel, gives them two choices. Follow God, or follow the gods of this world. But in the Gospel reading, Peter shows us there really isn't much left to decide. For humanity is broken itself, and it needs fixing. But there's only one person who is capable, only one we can go to, for all humanity has been left with this decision. Stay broken, or go to the one who can fix us. For so this week we reply with Peter, and with all the Israelites and all Christians of all time. Where shall we go? But to Jesus, our bread of life. You see, when it comes to fixing broken things, there's a major difference between that trained eye and our common untrained eye. For the trained eye will see all those small deficiencies and cracks in the item, while the untrained eye will simply look right over them and think them to be nothing. But that is why when something is broken, we search for the experts who know exactly what to look for and also how to fix it. Yet what would life be without conflict in even these simple situations? For too often, we like to question that expert opinion, thinking ourselves the experts. We then reject the solution they propose, thinking that it really isn't broken in the first place, or maybe we know better how to fix it. We sometimes even take offense if what we're told doesn't line up with what we believe to be the problem. So far, you're probably thinking I'm still talking about computers or inanimate objects. The reality is, this is us, too. We don't like having problems that we can't fix. We like it even less when someone tells us what we're doing wrong, or that even more, we're the problem ourselves we take offense. We tell ourselves that what's broken really isn't. 
I only work a couple extra hours a week. I'm not an actual workaholic. I don't drink that much. It's just me spoiling, spoiling myself a little. I never get angry that often. Just when everyone is messing up and needs correcting. Guess how quickly our sinful nature leads us to take offense to such a simple proposition. Rather than listening to the true expert who seeks to help us. This is indeed what happens in the gospel reading. As we finish up reading John chapter 6, Jesus has been laying out there how everyone who's broken can be fixed or healed. He's been explaining to them how he gives life to all who believe that they may live eternally. But the problem with this crowd is that the people don't want to admit that they're broken. They don't want to accept Jesus' expert opinion, for so we heard it read. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? This is a hard saying. It wasn't hard in the way that they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Quite the opposite. They knew quite well what Jesus said, but it was hard because they didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to accept that Jesus is the only way for them to have life. That Jesus is the sole expert. That Jesus is the one who gives us his literal body and blood as bread and wine for us to eat and to drink. Yes, the people thought Jesus and everything he said to be absurd. They would much rather ignore the problem, think it's not an issue, and remain broken, eating that regular bread, which so too their fathers ate, and die. But at this point, Jesus turns to the twelve, and ask them, even as he asked us, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know you are the Holy One of God. Where else shall we go, Lord? There's no other expert but you. You indeed have the words of eternal life. As Peter speaks on behalf of the twelve, and also on our behalf, to acknowledge that the best place for us is none other than at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, which show us not only what's broken in our lives, but also points us to the solution the answer to all of our problems. So we hear Jesus say, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Yes, Jesus comes to abide with us, that we may sit before him and hear his words, be filled with them. For in his word we hear the solution to all of our problems, all the brokenness of humanity. We hear those words of eternal life. Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Take, drink. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. So Jesus told us, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. This is the meal which Jesus prepares for you, 
by going to the cross, offering up his life as, our as a substitute for ours. For on that cross, he takes your sins and gives you forgiveness. He takes your brokenness and gives you his holiness. He takes your death and gives you his life. Truly, where else shall we go? But to Jesus, our bread of life. Just as Joshua and Israel acknowledged, alongside Peter and the disciples, the place we should want to be and sit is none other than at the feet of Jesus and his cross the one and only expert in life. For this is where, as a Christian, Jesus calls us to abide in him, even as he has already come to abide in us. This is why Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Yes, blessed indeed. Blessed because we come and hear those words, of eternal life. For by these words, Jesus comes to abide with us, to teach us, to correct us, to comfort us, to lead us, to raise us, and grant us life. For this is why we return to our Lord every week, to come and sit and abide with him, as he comes and is present with us in his word and sacraments. Even more as a Christian, there should be no place we'd rather be than here, sitting before our Lord's table, that we may come and eat and drink of his true body and blood. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may we go nowhere else but to Jesus, our bread of blood, that we may always hear his words, eat his body and drink his blood, and be filled with eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.